<laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and especially be in, in the C4C. Um, <clears throat> I just want to make one statement as I'm still in my present company for this month and then I'm leaving the company. Uh, and it's a forward-looking safe harbor statement. So just, I have the actual statement here, but just to abbreviate it, uh, my talk today is meant only for general illustrative purposes about starting a life science company and is not meant to represent investment-related matters associated with Provencio. So I'm talking as an EIR and not as a board member and CCO of Provencio. So that's um, one aspect of it. So uh, just to get started here, I want to talk in first general terms about what the problem is that my company has addressed uh, over, over these years. And to start with it, <clears throat> it actually has to do with the number one disease in the United States. And that is, of course, uh, heart-related indications. It's a very large market space. Uh, it encompasses over $330 billion a year in spending, and it's uh, in constant flux and change because of new technologies uh, that come along and effects of those technologies. Um, there is very little drug development that's been done over the years in the cardiac space, and that's due to some of the particular aspects of the disease, for example, in a heart attack, uh, tissue goes to scarring, and that tissue is dead. It's very difficult to develop a drug for that particular indication. Uh, but there's a lot of room for new, for new development in this area. Also, <coughs> uh, big changes in healthcare, as we know, with the Affordable Care Act. And with the Affordable Care Act, uh, that has uh, resulted in a whole change of focus towards outcome-based medicine. We're developing a product we call Heart, and it's for the emergency room specifically for chest pain patients. And the way that it works is the following. Um, about 550,000 people will show up in emergency rooms like the University of Washington that have already had a heart attack. So they arrive by ambulance, okay? And so already today with these kinds of numbers, you can expect the emergency room and cardiologists are dealing right now with an individual who's already had a heart attack. If that happens, there's a gold standard procedure for those individuals. And this is with my cartoon skills here. So here's a person lying on a cath bed, and they're getting a cardiac catheterization. I'm going to just abbreviate that as cath today. What that means is that they're getting between 1,000 and 1,400 chest x-rays. They're getting contrasting dye, and, they're <laughs> and the contrasting dye has some real limitations that may result in kidney damage, whether or not they've needed the cardiac catheterization. The, the reference to the x-rays, this could be important long-term for cancer development. Some people die on the cath bed, and that's uh, in part due because of uh, age of the individuals that may be there. Then the last thing here is that for an emergency room cardiac catheterization, <clears throat> the American Heart Association reported in their annual 100-page thick statistics report that that cost is $39,000. And the last thing I want to mention about this is really as a big problem is that there's about 1.1 million of these cardiac caths done a year. And the in, report in the New England Journal, uh, um, up to 50% of those are unneeded. With regards to Prevencio and what we're doing is that we're looking at this as a very important procedure for those individuals that need it. But you've got six million people coming through the emergency room every year, and not all of them need it. And again, that's why we see so many that get the procedure that don't need it. So if somebody shows up today, what's going to happen, they're going to get a troponin assay. And the troponin is an in vitro diagnostic assay looking for a protein in cardiomyocytes. As those cells blow up, they release troponin into the bloodstream. And that's a great way, combined with an ECG, to be able to tell that the person has had a heart attack. So 
The f this is important for another reason, because cardiologists are already used to using an in vitro diagnostic assay. So we don't have to come and say, we've got something new for you. They already know about it and, and are very well familiar with it. So this is not our product. So this is not our space. So this is all the people out here are very well taken care of. And there's a race to get them to the calf bed uh, so that they can get the fastest possible care. So that intervention with a stent, if it's done the shorter period of time, we know that the outcomes are better. And again, this is really driving it home with the Affordable Care Act. So where we're at is in this space with these six million patients. Because what happens and what's gonna happen tonight is about 100 patients, I'm just making this number up, but just, just for the explanation of it, about 100 patients are gonna show up in the emergency room here tonight. And the problem, and they're outside of these people that, have, that arrive by ambulance, but these people are coming in and they're complaining about chest pain. And <clears throat> they're gonna have a variety of issues. It could be heartburn, it could be a valve issue, it could be nerves, it could be all different kinds of things that may bring them there. Or it could be obstructive coronary artery disease. Because the thing about a heart attack is, you know, you know obviously that, that point where it's actually occurred, but it's a mystery as to the times before. We know individuals with normal cholesterol levels uh, that, that don't have uh, weight issues, uh, appear to be normally healthy, that fall over dead of a heart attack. So there's something to that story about being able to stratify these individuals. So if we could stratify uh, these folks, then we'd have a better idea of assigning these people correctly to get a cardiac cath and have the 50% go home. So there's a good economic uh, component to all of this. So basically what happened, and here's the scientific background on it, as I was talking with Bill, and uh, having a series of conversations. And he was telling me about an experiment that he and his colleagues had done called the compensatory heart response. And so they had used rat hearts and they had induced a myocardial infarction in one part of the heart. And then they were looking at transcript levels in other regions of the heart. And what's really interesting here is that the patterns of gene expression in other parts of the heart that were not damaged were responding in very predictable and reproducible ways. Whereas this tissue under a normal stress and damage had a completely different expression pattern. Now, what Bill took away from that and, and it, you know, you get some of these things after you've done these experiments or sometime you, something else sifts in and he thought, well, why not use the heart and it, these expression patterns as a reporter system so that the heart is actually reporting the kind of stress that it's getting. Now we know in this induced case of actually forming the heart attack in rats what happened. But the, the idea was and how we started this company was can we find a protein signature, in our case, not RNA transcripts, but can we find a protein signature that can identify these people? And can we then stratify them into two different groups? So that's what we started. So that's part one. There's two more parts to that. The second part is Bill has had a collaboration with three cardiologists at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, doctors. Uh, McNamara, Mariquin, and Mulakulta. And they have been, become colleagues of ours in that they have a very valuable resource. They've had a 2,000 patient cohort where all of them got the cardiac cath and all of them had a blood draw. So now all of a sudden we're, we're in a really unusual and fortunate situation where we know what happened to all the individuals. <clears throat> and because the cardiac cath is a gold standard, we could really, they could go back and they could do the measurements of stenosis and find out just exactly how blocked these arteries are. So, and they also had a very good list of biomarkers they wanted to look at 
biomarkers I wanted to look at and Bill as well. So we set about, and this is going to be important for the financing part, and I'm going to come over that again. But the f So this enters into the third part of it about the discovery, and that is that we did a pilot experiment. So we looked at 56 patients with now into the technology a multiplex proteomic assay. So we're looking at multiple antibody pairs and recombinant protein controls, and we're looking at 56 patients, and we're essentially letting the markers tell us what's working, okay? And it worked. And so we were able to tell from that study that about 15% of the patients had really obstructed coronary arteries, and 85% didn't have a problem. So their, whatever got them to the emergency room to get a cath, th that wasn't it. It wasn't because they had obstructed arteries, okay? And so we then, to make a long story short, now the company starts to pick up steam. Now we're out of the pilot phase, and this is also going to be the seed round phase I'll talk about in a moment. So now we've got these really interesting results. How can we ramp the company up and make it into a going concern? So what we did is we, of course, you know, proof of concept is what everybody wants and really needs, and so we did more proof of concept experiments, and that's published uh, in a paper that uh, I had some copies of that are in the back, and a couple of comments about that in terms of the publication. Um, this is in BMC Medicine, and the, the point I want to make about this, it has an impact factor of 6.8 when it was published. In contrast, you have the New England Journal of Medicine with an impact factor of about 38. But six, above six is good because it gets a lot of people to look at it. And that's important because we want, we want that to occur. We want to start to spread the awareness about this at a very low cost. So here we are over here with some news. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So as that now, so now as we're starting to gel the company and we're now starting to bring in other resources, most of those, by the way, now in comparison to the first company I started, is instead of hiring people in, we're doing so much outsourcing. And we've got fantastic consultants. Uh, we have a former in vitro diagnostics director of the FDA, who's our FDA director. And we have other individuals that are, that are uh, in the reimbursement sector and clinical trial design. So all these people we couldn't afford ever to bring into the company, but it's all outsourced. So with that in mind, <laughs> then we really get into the nuts and bolts of starting the company. So I want to look at it from that perspective of the startup part of it. OK, so we have all the components. And I'm not going to talk about this in great detail because you already uh, are going to know about these things. But this is the first part of it is the corporate council. So even in the beginning days when I'm talking to Bill, we're setting this up to see what kind of a structure that we can do. So we did an LLC incorporated in Delaware. Okay? And by the way, the corporate council is just one of the most important components of the entire company. We've been using uh, Cooley Godward and Sonia Erickson, who's just been fantastic for us. And just, it's really key because um, my topic, of course, today is an exit strategy, and it, so it's really important at the exit that all the papers have been done correctly and all the investments have been done. So, for example, in our case, as we want to have an exit strategy, we're really, here's our exit more than likely, at least that's what we're setting ourselves up for, for Abbott, Johnson & Johnson, or Roche to buy our company. So if, for that event to take place. We've really got it when we're raising stock, for example, in our particular case, we only take investment funds from accredited investors, and that's from angel investors. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, we have the initial formation of a management and team and board, of course. The location is starting out virtual, but at some point it has to be a physical reality. People need to be able to meet. FDA is a huge concern for us, from, and this is really from the very, very beginning as we get this strategy, because to create value in, in the company, you know, we've got to get FDA approval. You know, and, and so we're thinking about that in the very beginning. Uh, toxicology would be appropriate more so if this was a drug company, but 
you know, that, that's just in the, in the scheme of things. The patent process that's important. Uh, in my first company, we had licensed four patents already that were already done. I actually like this scenario in this company that I was able to be one of the inventors in the technology because I could st help to steer uh, the claims. And if you're ever in that situation, that's really good because you, you have a pretty good understanding of where things, where, where you hope things are going. Okay, so that's really key. Tech transfer is really uh, so key and so important here. In the very beginning, we started with an option agreement. And when we talked to the folks in the Office of Technology Management, where all this, by the way, is from the University of Pittsburgh, they were laughing at us because they said, you want to license something, but it doesn't even exist, <laughs> okay? So this is just an idea. And we said, no, we really do want to license it because we really do want to go through the university system because there's so many advantages. And so we've had a very good working uh, relationship with them where they also let us pick the patent council that, from a list that they had. And so we've been very fortunate to get one of the top firms in the United States, Baker Botts, as our patent council. Okay, so there's all the mechanics of it. That's really mechanical. These parts are really pretty easy, of course, you know, to, and they, they come early, but they've got to be done right for the exit strategy. Okay, because I mean, for one example, let me just, just give that. For the investors, if we have a small, if we have two pools of investors, friends and family, and then also accredited investors, at some particular point, everything is scrutinized by the acquiring company. And of course, anything having to do with, you know, anything that may affect them, you know, like two classes of investors could be material. And so, of course, we would have started the company that way if that's what we needed to do. But it's really much easier where we can say, yes, all of our investors are accredited. There's no issues with having more than one class of investor, just for one of, uh, of a number of examples. Okay, what I want to talk about now is, and, and it's more apropos towards this exit strategy, is we look here at the landscape. And again, these are all things you, that you would know, you know very early at this point. At least you can start to fill in what you think the landscape is. And at least for what we did, is we had certainly the companies that we are targeting ourselves to uh, who, would, who would acquire us. Certainly the emergency room doctors and cardiologists. So we address that by our publication schedule. Okay, hospitals, similar vein here. Insurance companies, and of course Medicare, Medicaid, and then individual payers. And so we've gone to all of the major insurance companies. We've written to all of them. They're all aware about our product. Okay, so as they start to see that news coming about, because that's really about the only thing that we can affect. You know, this is really the only thing that Provencio can affect here. We can do a lot on these other areas, but at least that news is about the only thing that we can do in the, in, in for the landscape. Okay, and then certainly we've identified the patents. FDA is really crucial to us and what kind of claims that we get because to get that, that's the, you know, real seal of approval that's going to make a difference in the marketplace. I want to give a point about this, about where our focus is too, and that is, when you look at these companies, okay, they have relationships with the doctors, and they have relationships with the payers, <coughs> and they certainly have relationships with FDA and with the news. But if you look at Provencio, that's why I make a point, we don't have that, okay? And I really belabor this point because these companies have really excellent sales forces who know who the buyers are. It's not so obvious in all 50 states who the exact buyer is in a hospital system and the decision makers, okay? They've got all of those relationships. So everything that I've talked about so far in all these relationships with tech transfer and working together in the collaborative sen sense is exactly that, collaborations. But here I belabor the point that if we think that we're going to go out and start selling product once we get FDA approval, we've got to compete with these guys. And so our heads are not around that. We are thinking we are not positioning ourselves. We're not hiring. We're not studying this. We think, you know, really the exit strategy here is to make ourselves, you know, to fit right. 
with the, with the market, uh, medical market space so that we'd sell the company to one of these. Now, upon getting through the entire process, we still go all this route. Who knows what the environment is, you know, in two, three years from now. So yes, it could be that we don't have a buyer for the company at that point. And it may be that we start to launch some sales. So that is a possibility. And we'd certainly have the option to do that, as you can see. We'd have to raise more money for that because that proposition, again, because of these relationships that we do not have, is a really big ticket. You know, it's just really, really uh, that much, uh, so challenging in order to do that. And so because we appreciate that, we've just organized it in this particular way that that's really our exit strategy. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the basics on this. And this, is, um, <laughs> this has been our startup. And uh, it's, you know, it's something, um, I, I want to say this also about fundraising. And I, I did want to kind of close with this thing about angels. Um, when I started my first company, we had a combination of both angel and venture capital money in the company. And that's great. That worked out. That was starting in 2000. And so that, that was that scenario. In the meantime, as we all know, the, the whole venture capital community has shrunk drastically. There's far fewer VC companies even to go to if you want to. And then their story is that it's got to be greater than $5 million or it's not worth their time even to due diligence. So now the pool of VCs that even have that money is pretty small. These guys have strategic venture funds within those companies. And that's really great, except that they really like late stage development. They'd like you to be all the way up to FDA. You're just about ready to go. You need another five, 10 million. OK. You know? So that's not really the source of money here. Okay? So for us, the, the funds that we have gone after, and this is Gary Frank in our company, uh, is to go after angel investors who are highly, you know, that um, are high net worth and can sign the accredited investment form. Now, that turns out to be a good scenario. And just to let you know how that goes, it's going to break out into different groups of angel investors. You may have one or two coming in for a smaller amount, twenty-five dollars or $50,000. You may, in the other end of the spectrum, you may have an, a, um, super angel that's coming in for a half a million dollars or more. And then the other point about that is, is that over time you certainly need more monies and you're, you're going back to the angel investors and, and explaining the story and, you know, telling them where you're at in a very, uh, in, in the following sense, especially as I'm running out of room, but uh, to be transparent. So it's the good and the bad and everything else there and, and how things take time. But um, I think that's been really instrumental with angel investors. There's um, the typical thing. One of the things that we find is that there's one angel investor and they know somebody and they know somebody. And so the typical thing that we've done is you know, we have gone through that. Because if they liked it, they may know somebody else that does like the story too. And so that's been a real important way on how we've been able to grow the company. Uh, just a couple other points on that. So we've been careful in the sense that we have to give incentives to angel investors, we think. And so we've been giving warrant coverage, about an extra 20%. So if you're a $100,000 investment, you may get another 20% in warrants on that. And so if everything works out well, you have no tax obligation to that. But at the time of sale, then you'd have a hopefully a you know, good scenario for that. So angel investors look for that, and, and uh, th that can give just a bit of a better incentive uh, to invest. So, but the, so for that, I mean, this has been a scenario in companies that need less than $5 million to get to, the, to get to their various endpoints. So in our particular company, we've raised $3 million to date, and now we're starting another raise, a Series B raise, for $5 million, and we feel that'll take us all the way up to FDA uh, submission. And so that's, you know, in all things considered, oh, and then the last thing on that is, is for a consideration that we look at all the time is, is that we're keeping the debt low or non-existent in our case. 
And then also, we're not getting a lot of shares outstanding. So it's not like we're, you know, 20 million shares outstanding after, you know, because we've been given so much away. Because that that really doesn't do the company any service either. So, so keeping those things in mind really help out. Uh, a little difficult to do, uh, but because you want to give incentives to investors. But I think we're in a good position now. So the the future of the company is the following: to raise this five million dollars, and to use that towards going for a pre-FDA assay and test that, and then go through a multi-site clinical trial, talking to FDA, and then going forward. Okay. So the last thing I leave you with <laughs> is um, that I've actually had some great benefits here from EIRs. <laughs> and so um, I'm glad to be back and giving something a little bit back for this, because uh, we've had Tom Clement, who many of you know, was an bo early board member uh, at the very beginning and extremely helpful, especially on the medical device side, where we didn't have a lot of depth in that area. Okay. And then more recently, uh, I met Perry Fell here in 2010. He's been enormously helpful. He's been uh, chairman of the board of our company since August and has been very active. So we really appreciate that. And then Rhonda Ryan uh, is our new CEO as of from last August. And so as the company now morphs and changes from the startup, now it becomes an early stage company is, and it continues to hit these milestones, becomes a late stage company, and then hopefully one day down here at uh, the UWER, our products will be there and help a lot of people. Thank you. <laughs>